for more than 135 years, the effort to unmask a depraved and vicious murderer has gripped generations. Yet the identity of the infamous serial killer known only as Jack the Ripper remains shrouded in mystery. There is one man, however, who was so interesting to investigators that he was actually arrested on suspicion of being the elusive slasher. Could a flamboyant, arrogant, quack doctor who famously despised women be the monster who terrorized Whitechapel in 1888? Or is he just another among many red herrings in the case? Let's find out. This is the story of Dr. Francis Tumble T. It might just be the most well-known set of serial murders in history. Throughout the late summer and much of the fall of 1888, a killer going only by the name Jack the Ripper stalked the streets of the Whitechapel neighborhood in East London. To understand the story of the man I'm about to share with you, it's important to first know about the brutal crimes. Before I go into that, let me preface this by saying that the Jack the Ripper case is a complex one, with many nuances and schools of thought on its many aspects. For the sake of argument, we're going to proceed with facts that are most generally accepted. If there are Ripperologists watching, hopefully this disclaimer is enough to earn your forgiveness for the basic retelling of the murders. Whitechapel was known to be a rough and impoverished section of London, and as such, crime was rampant. It was a type of neighborhood where screams in the middle of the night would hardly be caused to raise an eyebrow. It's generally accepted that Jack the Ripper was responsible for five murders between late August and early November of 1888. Because of the type of area Whitechapel was, however, similar murders occurred during the general time frame of the agreed-upon Ripper slayings. Murder had a home in Whitechapel, so some question remains as to whether or not there were more that could be credited to him. In any case, we're going to stick with what's called the canonical five victims. Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. Each of the women were known as ladies of the night, and all of them had their throats cut. Four of the victims were mutilated to varying degrees after death. In addition to her neck wound, Nichols had slashes across her abdomen, while Kelly's body was completely annihilated with her insides removed and either placed around her or taken by the killer. Chapman, Eddowes, and Kelly each had their uteruses removed partially or completely. Stride was the only victim not mutilated, and it's believed this is because the Ripper was interrupted in the act. This occurred on the night of September 30th, otherwise known as the double event. Shortly after Stride's body was found in the early morning hours, Edo's body was discovered less than a mile away. It's the only time the killer struck twice in the same night. Kelly was the only victim not discovered on a Whitechapel street as her murder took place inside her apartment. Again, this is merely a synopsis of the Ripper murders. But now we're all up to speed enough to understand what makes a man named Dr. Francis Tumblety such an interesting person to the case. Francis Tumblety was born in 1833, likely in either Dublin or Limerick, Ireland. The youngest of 11 children, Tumblety and his family emigrated sometime between the late 1830s and 40s to Rochester, New York one of America's very first boom towns, thanks to its location along the Genesee River, Erie Canal, and Lake Ontario. While records of his early life are limited, he was said to be a dirty, awkward, ignorant, uncared for, good-for-nothing boy utterly devoid of education from the time he was a young man. His interest in medicine was piqued when his brother started working for a local doctor named Ezra Reynolds. As you'll find in this story, the term doctor should be taken loosely, as Reynolds was more of a self-proclaimed physician than an accredited one. One of the ways he made money, in addition to his French cures for STDs, was by selling literature of an anatomical nature, although none of the content had a medical purpose, if you catch my drift. As a teenager, Tumblety started working for Reynolds as one of his valets charged with marketing him through the sale of these very adult pamphlets to lonely sailors traveling the Erie Canal between Rochester and Buffalo. Soon after, Tumblety saw an ad in the newspaper for an Indian herb doctor named Rudolph Lyons who was setting up shop in Rochester, and he was quickly hired after showing interest in learning under Lyons. Apparently, his time peddling skin magazines and marketing counterfeit physicians gave Tumblety all the medical knowledge he needed, so he set off on his own, 
and it should come as little surprise that he advertised himself as an Indian herb doctor who specialized in French cures for STDs. There's a term for self-appointed doctors who sell what amounts to snake oil as cures for serious diseases. They're called quacks, and Tumblety had the insult lopped in his direction often. Still, this did nothing to stop his early success, but it wouldn't last. As was so often the case with quack doctors, he had to skip town once most of his patients figured out that he was a fraud. He fled to Canada where he quickly ran afoul of the law, first for practicing without a license in Toronto, and then for performing an illegal abortion on a sex worker in Montreal. A grand jury determined there was not enough evidence to indict him, so he left for St. John. In 1860, one of his patients there died while taking a medication he had prescribed, and it looked like the doctor's medical practice and freedom were in jeopardy, so he fled the country and returned to the United States. This led him to Boston, where he reinvented his image, likely knowing that he had to add way more style to cover up his stunning lack of substance. He began making grand entrances into towns, where he'd ride a white horse while dressed in extravagant military uniforms. To his credit, it worked. Physically, Tumblety stood somewhere between 5'11 and 6'4, with blue eyes and a handsome face and a long, dark mustache. Combined with a confident, charismatic personality, he had an oily charm that meshed well with his often flamboyant manner. Not only that, he looked extremely wealthy and successful. As soon as he'd get himself situated in a new city, people would line up with fistfuls of money, ready to hand it over for his so-called medicines. He marketed himself as the pimple banisher, and just like Reynolds and Lyons, he hired young male valets to help spread the word about him. Also, just like Reynolds and Lyons, Tumblety earned the attention of more than just the public as he was arrested on several occasions for having relations with those valets. By the first shots of the Civil War, Tumblety had worn out his welcome after establishing himself in New York City. A reporter with Vanity Fair had come across the quack doctor's office and noted photos that Tumblety posted outside, which looked as if they might have once formed part of the collection of a lunatic, as the reporter wrote. He left the city and settled in Washington, D.C., although he did not parade into town like he usually did. Instead, he spent two years trying to figure out his next move, and in that time, he dreamed up a career for himself as a surgeon. With the Civil War raging, surgeons were highly sought after by the military, but Tumblety believed he needed to distance himself from his reputation as an Indian herb doctor if he was going to convince the government that he was qualified. If he was able to earn a stamp of approval from the U.S. Army, in his mind, he'd be able to forego traditional medical training to earn the title of medical doctor. As was often done by actual doctors at the time, Tumblety organized a medical lecture and invited military officers to attend so he could show off his legitimacy as a physician. What he really showed off was cause for concern as he proudly displayed medical specimens that he seemed just way too excited about. None of this impressed army officials and Tumblety wasn't invited to become a Civil War surgeon. In 1862, he went back to his original con and began advertising his Indian herb medicines in Washington, D.C. At some point during his time there, Tumblety claimed to have made the acquaintance of a man named Abraham Lincoln, and it wouldn't be the last time those two names would have an association. On April 14, 1865, in Ford's Theater, John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln during a play and the president would pass away from the wound the next morning. A hunt for his assassin got underway and as the investigation progressed, a conspiracy of Southern sympathizers was discovered. On May 5th, just less than a month after the president's tragic death, Tumblety was arrested during his travels to St. Louis and returned to Washington, D.C. on suspicion of being complicit in the assassination conspiracy. This may have been a simple case of mistaken identity, though. To cover up his reputation, Tumblety took to using false names, and at the time he was working under the name J.H. Blackburn, which was similar to the name of another man sought for potential involvement in a different plot. It didn't take long for Tumblety to be cleared as there was no hard evidence that implicated him and there was a lot of doubt around whether he was even associated with any of the conspirators. That is, until one of Booth's errand boys came forward and alleged that Booth and Tumblety had a quote-unquote very intimate relationship. He also alleged that Tumblety had a similar relationship with David Harold, who was convicted and hanged as a result of his role in the conspiracy. No further investigation was done into Tumblety being part of it though. In 1869, Tumblety left the United States for Europe, and by July 1873, he had opened an office in Liverpool, so he spent months at a time practicing his form of medicine there. 
No longer, however, did he market himself as an Indian herb doctor. Instead, the move to England allowed him to try something new. Now, he was calling himself the Great American Doctor. He maintained the office there throughout the 1870s and 1880s while also practicing in the United States, causing him to continually travel back and forth. And this is when we finally get to the potential exploits of Tumble Tea in East London. It's the early morning hours of September 30th, 1888, when the front door of a lodging house at 22 Batty Street in Whitechapel swung open. A man stepped inside and went directly to his room that he was renting there, drawing the attention of the property's landlady. The man had been staying there for some time, but the movements from his room sounded rushed and frantic, which disturbed the landlady's sleep. What she didn't know at the time was that, around one o'clock that morning, the slain body of Elizabeth Stride was found one block away, on Burner Street. Whoever killed her had made a hasty getaway, as it's believed the murderer was interrupted in the act by passersby, but a search of the area turned up no one suspicious. It was like the murderer vanished into thin air. Interpretations of what actually occurred at the lodging house that night vary because the landlady was German and spoke poor English, but what could be ascertained was that she was in possession of a bloodstained shirt and a black leather bag commonly used by doctors of the day. Both of these items are said to belong to the same man, now known as the Batty Street Lodger, and there's reason to believe that the Batty Street Lodger and Jack the Ripper are one and the same. There's also reason to believe that the Batty Street Lodger was none other than Dr. Francis Tumblety. You might be wondering why someone of Tumblety's means would have chosen Whitechapel as a place to stay during his visit to London, but there's a very good explanation for this. During the Victorian era, it was common for people of wealth to either visit or stay in impoverished areas as a sort of twisted hobby. It was an activity called slumming, and motivations for participating in it varied from person to person. Some did it for charitable reasons, while others did it for sheer curiosity of how the other half was living, likely looking down their noses at the lower class people they came across. Tumblety was known to be into slumming, and while his reasons for this are unknown, he admitted in an interview with a New York newspaper to being in Whitechapel at the time of the Ripper murders. His reasons for being there might be revealed by his arrest on November 7, 1888, when he was charged with gross indecency against four men. All the charges stem from separate incidents that went back as far as July 27th, but if we look beyond the legal lingo, Tumblety was arrested for participating in consensual homosexual acts with the men. Whitechapel was just such a place for such activities to go unnoticed, but the problem was that Tumblety was constantly under surveillance by police. At the time, he was being watched by Scotland Yard for apparently being sympathetic to an Irish political extremist group. Whether or not Tumblety was in Whitechapel is not up for debate, but his being the Batty Street Lodger is. Part of the uncertainty comes from how police handled this part of the case. It's believed that they didn't want to give anything away publicly about the lodger, so the landlady and her identity were protected. Although the name Mrs. Cure did appear in one newspaper article in October of 1888. Detectives were asked by reporters about the bloodstained shirt, but they would not confirm it. And there's a reason for this. Police believe they were hot on the trail of Jack the Ripper, and the man they suspected was known to skip town with the use of assumed names. There's no conclusive proof that Tumblety was the Batty Street Lodger, but the circumstantial evidence against him is difficult to ignore. Again, he was in Whitechapel at the time of the murders. Inside the black doctor's bag was a knife that was used for amputations at the time. It wasn't quite a scalpel, but it was sharp enough to cut through bones since that was one of its primary uses. It wasn't the type of knife that just anybody could get their hands on. But even with Tumblety's medical background being fraudulent, he could. The lodger matches physical descriptions of Tumblety and vice versa. And those who claim to have seen Tumblety out on the streets of Whitechapel saw him approaching the working women of the district. The only remaining question here is whether or not the Batty Street Lodger was Jack the Ripper, and once again we're left with a pile of compelling circumstantial evidence. Where Stride's murder took place on Burner Street is almost in the backyard of the lodging house at 22 Batty Street. Around 15 minutes before Stride's body was discovered, a witness named Israel Schwartz spotted some sort of conflict between Stride and a man. Not wanting to get involved in the dispute, Schwartz crossed the street, and as he did, yet another man shouted a Jewish slur at him. 
so Schwartz wasted little time leaving the area. As is evident by this, the area around Stride's crime scene was rather active, so it was a daring move by the Ripper to commit her murder at that time in that place. The man who discovered her body could tell by the state of it that her murder had just taken place, leading police to believe he frightened the murderer and caused him to flee. As I mentioned, a cursory search of the area revealed nothing and no one out of the ordinary, and it was as if he disappeared. If Jack the Ripper was the Batty Street Lodger, then it's more than plausible that he fled to the relative cover of the lodging house. About 45 minutes after Stride was discovered, the body of Catherine Eddowes was found at the extreme west end of Whitechapel, meaning the killer somehow evaded detection as he walked across town. The best way to do that might have been to change his clothes before heading in that direction. In the years leading up to the Whitechapel slayings, Tumblety is said to have become ill and believed his own death was imminent. Just prior to leaving for London in May of 1888, he was interviewed by a journalist in Toronto and mentioned that he was suffering from heart and kidney disease. If we combine this with the fact that Tumblety had an unwavering hatred of women, particularly sex workers, there's a school of thought that says the quack doctor's belief in his impending death gave him the chance to commit the murders without fear of a lengthy reprisal if he got caught. Depending on your outlook, this might seem like a circumstantial factor that requires a leap of faith to believe. In that case, it's important to get a glimpse into just how depraved Tumblety was in his hatred of women, and there's perhaps no better testimony than that of U.S. Army Colonel Charles A. Dunham. During an 1888 newspaper interview, Colonel Dunham said that he attended one of Tumblety's medical lectures while he was campaigning to be brought into the military as a battlefield surgeon. After the presentation, Tumblety hosted a dinner party for attendees at his home, and when all arrived, there was an obvious lack of women. One of Tumblety's guests inquired about this, and the entire party witnessed their host's demeanor change from cocky and boisterous to dark and brooding. He had been shuffling a deck of cards when the question was posed, and he put them down on the table in front of him before stating, No, Colonel, I don't know any such cattle. And if I did, I would, as your friend, sooner give you a dose of quick poison than take you into such danger. With that, Tumblety went on a complete tirade about women, denouncing their very existence with a level of anger that seemed out of proportion to his grievances. When he finished pontificating, he brought the entire dinner party into his office, where his demeanor shifted back to cheerful arrogance. He threw open the closet doors and revealed shelves of jars from floor to ceiling, each containing medical specimens. Excitedly, Tumblety began to pull several of his favorites off the shelves and place them on the table in front of his guests. When about a dozen of the jars were lined up, he introduced them as his prized collection of uteruses, which he mentioned were sourced from every social class of woman. It was one thing to hear about the collection, but it was totally different to see them and the joy they brought out in Tumblety. Later that same evening, the topic of women was brought back up as one of the military officers began to list off their virtues and charms, which only prompted Tumblety to launch back into an angry denunciation of them. One of the guests asked where this hatred of women came from, and Tumblety jumped into a story. As a young man, Tumblety married a woman after a brief courtship, and soon after their marriage, he noticed her proclivity for flirting with other men. He confronted her about this, and she eased his concern, so he dropped it until he witnessed her in one of the worst parts of town entering a brothel with another man. It was then that he learned that prior to and during his marriage, his wife had been involved in the industry he would come to despise. As word of the Ripper's murder spread across London, police received hundreds of letters from people claiming to be the murderer. Just like almost every other aspect of the case, there are multiple schools of thought on this. Some experts believe that none of the letters were authentic, while others are certain that some of them are from the killer himself. There are two that seem to pass the authenticity test. One known as the Dear Boss letter, and another referred to as the From Hell letter. In the Dear Boss letter, the writer signs his name Jack the Ripper, and this is the first time the name ever appears in relation to the case. It's safe to say that it stuck. In the letter, the killer writes with a mocking, arrogant tone and promises to clip the next victim's ears off. When Edo's body was discovered, part of her right ear had been severed, 
Additionally, this letter includes a postscript that includes the line, They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. This is likely in reference to speculation by police and the media that the killer might have had at least some medical knowledge. But this line could be interpreted in many ways. It certainly could have no double meaning at all and just be the killer having a laugh over what was being said about him. But could it instead be a sarcastic declaration by a quack doctor that he's finally earned the legitimacy he so desperately sought to that point? The From Hell letter is where things get really interesting. Handwriting analysis is controversial as there is never a completely conclusive way to prove a match, but there can be a degree of certainty assigned to comparisons. The science itself assumes that we all have handwriting characteristics that are subconscious. These can present themselves in a variety of ways, but examples could include the way somebody crosses their lowercase t's or what type of lowercase letter a we use. When an expert compared samples of Tumble T's handwriting against the From Hell letter, there were striking similarities between some of the characteristics. Some experts believe that a murderer will reveal the mode of killing through their handwriting. And an analyst named Michelle Dresbold believes that the lowercase f in both the From Hell letter and Tumble T's sample resembles scalpels or knives. This also relates to the lowercase y's in both samples as Dresbold writes on her website, in both scripts, the extra large loops of the Y extend to the line underneath it. In fact, the Ys are so exaggerated that they not only violate the line underneath them, they actually penetrate the handwriting two lines below. This, she said, is a characteristic shared by serial killer Ted Bundy. Perhaps the most notable similarity is the way the From Hell writer and Tumble T connect the word I to the word that follows it. According to Dresbold, odd connections like this can indicate unusual thinking processes. The important aspect of the From Hell letter, however, isn't just that Tumble T's handwriting appeared to be a potential match. It's also that there was a box that accompanied the letter. In it was half a human kidney, believed to be that of Eddowes. If Tumble T wrote the From Hell letter and the kidney did belong to Eddowes, it just about slams the door shut on the case. In the 1889 interview with a newspaper that Tumble T did, he was outright asked about suspicions of him being Jack the Ripper. His reply was typically haughty, but he was rather open about his candidacy as the killer. Again, this is where he admits to being in London, and more specifically Whitechapel at the time of the murders. Additionally, he discusses his arrest on November 12, 1888 on suspicion of being the killer, but he writes all of this off as a case of mistaken identity all because of a hat. There were witnesses who did in fact see the man responsible for the murders, and he was described as being well-dressed and wearing a slouch hat. If you're not familiar, a slouch hat is one typically made of felt with a wide, flexible brim. At the time, slouch hats were not common and most often seen in the military. Francis Tumblety was a fan of this hat, as dressing in military-style uniforms was part of his whole aesthetic. Because he wore a slouch hat, and the witnesses claimed the killer wore one too, Tumblety believed he was targeted for his choice of fashion. That doesn't explain away the fact that slouch hats would not have been a common sight in Whitechapel in 1888. A letter written in 1913 by John Littlechild offers an interesting connection to Tumblety and the Whitechapel murders. Littlechild was the chief inspector of Scotland Yard, although it's important to point out that he was not an investigator on the Jack the Ripper case. In the years following his retirement, he wrote a reply to a journalist who had written to him to ask about the potential Ripper suspect known as Dr. D. In his letter back, Littlechild dismisses a Dr. D and instead tells of a Dr. T that he considered a quote-unquote very likely suspect. He goes on to name Tumble T and explain that he was a frequent visitor to London who always seemed to garner the attention of police. Littlechild adds that Scotland Yard had a large dossier on him. While this letter is hardly conclusive evidence of Tumble T being Jack the Ripper, it is written by a highly credible source who believed the quack doctor to be a person of great interest to the case. It would be irresponsible to come to any conclusion about Tumble T as a suspect without presenting reasons he may not be the infamous Whitechapel murderer. His viability as Jack the Ripper has actually grown in recent years, but many experts on the killings point to other suspects as being much more likely. 
there are bits of circumstantial evidence that either point in other directions or just don't align with Tumblety as well. Littlechild pointed out in his 1913 letter that Tumblety wasn't a sadist, but that the killer almost certainly was. Eyewitnesses described the man they believed was the killer as being short and in his 20s or 30s. Tumblety was known to be tall and would have been in his 50s at the time of the murders. There's some agreement in the Jack the Ripper community that the slains were sexual in nature and Tumblety preferred the company of other men. It is important to point out, however, that there are just as many doubts about the murders being sexually motivated. Colonel Dunham's testimony about the dinner party is in some question simply because of his reputation. Prior to joining the military, Dunham was a lawyer and a reporter with a penchant for tall tales and half-truths. There were others at the dinner party who could have backed up Dunham's claims, but it's unclear if any of the other attendees ever came forward. Finally, the number of authentic Jack the Ripper victims has always been in question. Those considered to be the canonical five were undoubtedly killed at a time that aligned with Tumblety's presence, but as I said, Whitechapel was no stranger to murder or sex workers. It's possible that similar killings committed before and after the canonical five were the work of the same murderer, in which case Tumblety's whereabouts were accounted for elsewhere. After making bail on November 16, 1888, when he was arrested on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper, Tumblety fled the country under the name Frank Townsend and eventually returned to the United States. He resurfaced in New York City for a while, where he came under surveillance by police there in relation to the Whitechapel murders, but there was never enough evidence that would have called for his extradition to England. For a time, he returned to Rochester and lived with his sister before heading to St. Louis, where he died in 1903 from heart disease at the age of 70. His body was returned to Rochester and buried here, at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. So was Dr. Francis Tumblety the infamous Jack the Ripper? I'd love to know your thoughts. If you stuck around, thanks so much for stopping by. On your way to the next video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. And for now, I'll see you next time for more chilling history.